Once again, as we record this, it is not clear yet whether the uh, so-called Trump care bill will or will not pass the House of Representatives. What is clear is that a very, very large number of Republicans are going to vote for this destructive, uh, lethal, and, uh, and socially uh, irresponsible bill. And either way, I want it to be known and to be on the record uh, this weekend that these Republicans uh, voted for a bill that had some very clear uh, implications for personal economies as well as the national economy, personal health as well as national health. So here to talk about us about that with us now in a little more detail is Emily G. Emily is a did I pronounce that right, Emily, first of all? Yes, it's Emily G. Thanks for having me on the show. Oh, and thanks for coming on the show. And Emily is a health economist with the Center for American Progress. And in fact she is the health economist for the health policy team there. So, Emily, you've been writing about this bill quite a bit. You've been following it extremely closely. Um, let's start with this. Uh, the, the Republicans have tried to, in my estimation, in my opinion, paper over the, uh, more, some of the more horrific aspects of the first Trump care bill, particularly with the so-called Upton amendment and so on. So why don't we start with that? What is the Upton Amendment and what what do we think of its impact? Sure. So I think you used the right term there, which is paper over. And what the Upton Amendment um, attempted to do was actually make up for another amendment uh, proposed by uh, Representative MacArthur of New Jersey, which would have stripped uh, protections for people with pre-existing conditions if they experienced a gap in coverage. Um, this means that if you're someone who buys coverage on the individual market, um, you know, like many people do, if they lose a job, decide to retire early, um, are self-employed or work at a job with no health benefits attached, um, these people, if they experienced a gap in coverage, as 30 million Americans do each year, would be rated based on their health status. So in other words, if you're somebody who has something as relatively mild as asthma, you could face an additional $4,000 in premium costs. Um, if you have something more serious, like say pregnancy, it could be $17,000 more. Um, and we calculated that something you know very severe, like say breast cancer might cost you about $28,000 more for coverage. Um, and these you know certainly uh, are costs that most Americans, most of us can't afford. So because of, um, you know, this major weakness uh, in the in the MacArthur Amendment um, to appease moderates, Republican leadership offered eight billion dollars um, to Upton and other moderates to get their votes. Um, eight thousand eight billion dollars sounds like a lot to most of us, um, but in terms of health costs, it's uh, quite small. In fact, we find that it doesn't do hardly anything to close the gap. Um, and the funding that would be needed in order to fund high-risk pools for these people with pre-existing conditions. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about a total health economy in the U.S. of what? It's over 1.3 trillion now, isn't it? What? In fact, it's about one sixth of the total U.S. economy. Right. So, uh, you know, eight billion may sound like a big figure. It's not a big figure. So, in effect, this is kind of. Uh, a placebo move, isn't it? Economically speaking, isn't this something that's still going to leave people with pre-existing conditions, whether it's uh, people with asthma, like myself, by the way, or people with heart problems, like Jimmy Kimball's baby, or whoever we're talking about, people are going to go through life finding, under this plan, finding that precisely those people who need health insurance are going to find it too expensive to purchase. Is that a fair statement? Yes, and so, you know, if we, if we were to be generous and take the bill authors at, at, the, at their word, um, you know, that this could fund a high-risk pool, it still wouldn't be enough. Um, when we're talking about people with very serious pre-existing conditions, we're talking about people who have about $30,000 of health costs in a single year. Um, and I think what's far worse is the way both the bill and the amendments were written was in a very sloppy manner such that... Uh, certain provisions of the MacArthur Amendment risk undermining pre-existing condition protections for the entire non-group market, not just people with gaps in coverage. 
Yeah, and that's because of the provision that says, if I understand it cor correctly, that employer health plans, and most Americans who think they have okay coverage, think they have okay coverage because they're getting it either through Medicare or uh, if they're under 65 because they're getting it from their employer. And they may think they're immune uh, to the effects of this bill, but in fact, as I understand it, you can maybe enlighten me and and, and, and provide some detail, but as I understand it, this bill would strip them of certain protections because employer health plans can pick any state they want, apply the rules for, let's say, maximum uh, lifetime benefits or whatever, and uh, they can basically cherry pick. So as long as one state uh, uh, in, in implements lenient rules uh, from the employer's point of view, uh, everybody with health insurance is at risk, right? Yes, that is a problem that stems from something um, in the ACA called essential health benefits. Um, and what essential health benefits are is a list of 10 very basic things that you and I and probably most people would think health insurance should cover, like maternity care, mental health care, emergency room care. And the ACA says that any plan in the individual small group market needs to cover these things. Where this comes into play for employer insurance is that the ACA also bans lifetime and annual limits on coverage um, for anything in those 10 essential health benefit categories. Uh, the, the American Health Care Act, the Republican bill, would get rid of a federal definition or a federal standard for essential health benefits, it would let states set their own list of what is an essential health benefit and what within the category must be covered by plans. Um, and because that's used as a reference for employer-based plans, it means that um, if, say, for example, maternity care weren't covered under essential health benefits, then the plan could limit the amount that it would pay toward your having a child or having neonatal care. It could limit it to potentially zero, right? Um, and I, I theoretically, couldn't they do that for any benefit that most people would consider part of their medical coverage? I mean, we talk about psychiatric, we talk about maternity, that's bad enough, but couldn't they also decide, for example, that pulmonary care is not an essential benefit or heart disease is not covered? Uh, is it that elastic? Are they able to be that flexible in deciding what is or is not an essential benefit? So I think that's one of the things that you know, should have made this bill in the, uh, very hard to defend and also makes it hard to uh, fathom how bad, exactly how bad it could be is you know, a lot of this is left to state's discretion. Um, but what we do know for sure is that uh, prior to the ACA, many plans didn't cover maternity care, many didn't cover mental health uh, services, um, and I think those would definitely be two that we would see on the chopping block. Okay. Uh, what else should people know about the impact? I mean, because those two things are huge. Those two things are basically saying that uh, all, what is it, 110 million Americans who have employer-based coverage? Uh, are at risk, uh, as well as people on the exchanges. Uh, what else should people know about what so many Republicans uh, will be voting for or have voted for this week? Sure. So I think a lot of us who are policy wonks recently have been, got, been very wrapped up in the, the amendments to the bill and what they would do to cost and how many people they could cover. But uh, the real core problem with this bill is that 24 million people, according to the Congressional Budget Office, would have no coverage at all um, if it passes. Um, and so, you know, forget what things cost or, uh, you know, how cost sharing would work. These people would not have um, any insurance if they got cancer or um, had a car accident or, you know, had a, a, you know, a baby with a very severe condition like Jimmy Kimmel's. Right, and, 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 and you know, uh, to be clear, uh, they're voting on this without uh, a scoring from the Congressional Budget Office, uh, which is its own story of your responsibility. But uh, that 24 million figure that was attached to the original bill, really, I don't see anything in, in this, and it sounds like you don't see anything in this revised version that would bring that number down. It will still be 24 million people, probably, you know, based on what we know, that will be uninsured, right? And I would guess, uh, that includes probably about 11 million uh, from Medicaid and then the rest uh, elsewhere, you know, individual enrollees and so on. But is that more or less right in your estimation? So in qualitative terms, certainly this is a bill that's uh, a bad bill that's only gotten worse. 
Uh, I think the, the 24 million number could well grow when we see the CBO score, uh, hopefully next week. Um, you know, obviously too late for the vote. Um, but CBO said, has said previously that they have a standard for what they call coverage. You can't, you know, ensure just um, a very limited amount of services or very um, narrow set of benefits and call that health insurance coverage. So um, if they think that the bottom falls out of insurance standards under the uh, American Health Care Act, then they may well uh, count what Republicans think is co- coverage as not qualifying for the third definition of health insurance coverage. Well, that's going to be interesting, and it would certainly make it uh, tougher for these Republicans in any number of ways. But if the bill manages to make it through in anything like its current form into law, will make it tough for many, many millions of people as well. So Emily G., health economist for the Center for American Progress, thanks for your work on this topic, and thanks for coming on the show. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Same here.